All right, so thanks for joining. Um, we are talking today about the evolution, impact, and opportunities in e-prescribing. Uh, this is the second webinar on e-prescribing. The first was more an intro uh, with a little bit of uh, background information as well. Um, today, I think we're going to do a deeper dive into more of kind of the practical things that I've seen both as a physician and a product manager uh, around e-prescribing, and then kind of looking forward into what the future opportunities could be in this space, um, because we all know it's not going anywhere. There's been a lot of um, legislation, which we'll get into as well. So um, yeah, uh, and uh, before we get started here, I'll just tell a little bit about Ionix. Um, we're a tech company that helps uh, startups and enterprises. We do a lot of FinTech work, but um, our health tech work is, is also picking up right now. And I think um, just wanted to mention that I lead the health tech vertical at Ionix as well as I also consult um, for a lot of different companies, um, including Fortune 500 companies and quite a few institutional investors, um, generally in New York or overseas. Um, so let's just dive right into it. So I think everybody knows what e-prescribing is. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's the computer-based generation transmission and filling of a medical prescription. So this replaced, um, more or less replaced or displaced the traditional paper and fax prescriptions. Um, although we do see in other medical industries, like in the veterinary space, um, faxing is still very high on their list. Um, and they do a lot of paper scripts as well. So e-prescribing has yet to fully penetrate into um, other other types of medicine. Um, but in in human medicine, I should say, um, we see more than 80% of prescriptions today are e-prescribed versus written on paper um, in the US. And you'll see even even in rural areas, um, doctors are using a lot of e-prescribing. Uh, you'll see pharmacies, even small pharmacies have, have inbound um, e-prescribing uh, software. So really um, the, the digital transformation here is from that kind of manual to the digital processes. So um, it did fundamentally transform how we deliver care. Um, if you think about kind of what doctors used to do, it would be you come in, I talk to you, we you know, do a history, a little examination probably. And then at the end, if I do need to give you a prescription, it would be uh, maybe take less than a minute for me to scribble your, your name, age, birth date, maybe, uh, and then Latin shorthand for what medication I'm prescribing you, hand it to you, and then, you know, we can move on to the next thing. Uh, whereas nowadays, if you see the way that it works is that you have to ask the patient or the doctor will ask you if you're the patient, um, you know, is this still a good pharmacy? Where can we go? Um, and then actually filling out the prescription is generally about you know, six to 10 uh, boxes, which you need to fill out. So there's a search where you need to, you know, search for the correct medication, click it, then click, you know, quantity, click the dosage, click all these things, um, and then review it and then send it. So, and if you're doing multiple medications, you may have to go through this workflow multiple times. So it is quite time consuming, um, if you see today, but the goals for e-prescribing, um, that actually came out in the, in the original paper, um, is that they were looking for safety, efficiency, and convenience. So this was the official, uh, the first law, I guess, that came out um, when they were pushing e-prescribing. So how are they ultimately achieving these goals? Are they enhancing safety and efficiency? Um, convenience, I think, uh, we can also discuss here, but um, we're going to go through and uh, see. So here's, our, here's kind of our agenda. So we'll look at the evolution of e-prescribing tracing its origins and how it's transformed over the years. Then we'll discuss kind of the impact on various stakeholders, uh, healthcare providers, pharmacists, patients. And then we'll go into the challenges of e-prescribing, which is, which there are many, um, including usability, integration in the other systems, uh, data security is also up there. Um, and then probably the, what I'm looking forward to most, the future and opportunities of e-prescribing so we can kind of see the potential opportunities that can further enhance 
the effectiveness, um, as well as what they say, the safety and convenience of e-prescribing and then Q&A at the end. So kind of the evolution, um, we talked a little bit about the, the laws that were passed in order to uh, increase adoption. So in the early days, there was significant resistance. Um, this is like 2003 um, to the, because it was kind of a drastic change from traditional methods. And this came alongside, you know, um, a few years later, they had EHRs and all these things that were um, not quite mandated, but they were um, highly incentivized, we'll say. So um, it was a drastic change from, from traditional methods and healthcare providers needed to adapt to these technologies. And these technologies were not very good. If you look at um, what they looked like back then, some of them use the same interface today, um, which you don't see in other industries um, that you'll have a lot of these systems with a lot of users, a lot of revenue, and they look like Windows 95. Um, so some of them have matured. Um, some are more sophisticated, user-friendly. You'll see kind of like um, Dr. Chrono, I think, came out about eight, nine years ago, and they were the first iPad-based EHR. Uh, they were a Silicon Valley company, so it looked kind of sleek and new, um, more kind of like the design we expect from apps today. But the majority of these systems, um, as you're probably aware of, if you're using Epic or one of these other things at your hospital, um, they are not very um, pretty to look at. The UI is not great, and the UX is also uh, generally not good. So in addition to the other legislative push, um, such as the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act of 2003, which first incentivized the e-prescriptions, um, we will also point out that there was a regulatory catalyst for the electronic prescribing of controlled substances, or EPCS. So the 21st Century Cures Act 2016 um, introduced this mandate, which required physicians to electronically prescribe uh, a significant proportion of controlled substances. So this also, you know, further propelled adoption of e-prescribing um, because, you know, now there's an additional incentive, whether it's, uh, whether it's punitive or monetary, um, it's still pushing people towards e-prescribing. Um, so the impact, I think, what I've read a lot is that it streamlined the prescription process for providers, reducing the likelihood of errors and improving efficiency. Um, has it really improved efficiency? Uh, I think maybe in a lot of cases where you'd see errors or something like that, you can point out because there was a study in 2012 that I found that basically talked about number of errors per uh, 100 prescriptions was like 37 with paper and less than 10 on e-prescribing. But um, I didn't see if they really talked about what the errors were, like if they were causing harm or whether it was just like what the definition of an error was, right? Um, did it lead to an adverse event in the in the patient or was it some you know harmless uh, issue on the, on the prescription? Uh, and the other thing was that a lot of it talked about legibility. If you look online today, um, I don't see that from a pharmacist perspective. I don't know if we have any pharmacists uh, in the crowd today, but um, I think from a pharmacist perspective, I haven't really heard a lot of um, feedback of, I can't read this. I don't know what this is. Generally, there's enough, there's enough information um, for them to look at it and say, hey, okay, like I know what drug this is and what I need to do with this. Um, sorry, give me a second. One second. Um, yeah, so I read about that, but I'm not really sure how accurate that is. Um, but for pharmacists, I'd say that e-prescribing has simplified the prescription filling process. Um, and the need for clarification calls has reduced as well. Um, because you get everything just on a screen. Um, there's still a need for clarification calls, I'd say more for insurance purposes, uh, rather than um, anything else for like unclear, or um, if there's some kind of interaction that they saw that the physician didn't see. Um, and I think, as we're talking about that, it is um, one of the direct patient advantages is that you do when you e prescribe the 
the pharmacy gets it right away before you even leave your doctor's office in a lot of instances. So uh, you would wait less uh, at the pharmacy, you know, quicker prescription fills, and r it reduced the risk of lost prescriptions because as much as I liked paper scripts, uh, when I would just hand it to a patient, um, the patient losing it or having a bunch of errands that day and not getting around to filling it on time and all those things, um, you know, they could get lost. And there are even new startups coming up that are, that are working on this problem. Um, uh, medication adherence is a big issue, uh, in the States, not only because of cost, but of issues like this, where you'd see, um, when you have follow-up reminders, you have text messages, Hey, did you pick up your prescription? Uh, companies are doing this in an automated way these days. Um, you know, CVS pharmacy, for example, has their own kind of tracking system where they're, you know, where they send you automated messages just to check up on you, um, and things like that. So depending on where your prescription is sent, there are quite a few, uh, direct patient advantages that, that we see. Um, So challenges, this is something I can point out a lot of challenges today. Um, so despite all the advantages I pointed out, uh, e-prescribing still has a, a significant amount of challenges. So usually these systems require a lot of manual input and can be very time consuming for physicians um, and other healthcare providers, um, nurse practitioners as well. So. Um, whoever's prescribing takes a lot of time. So, um, you know, whether it's the clunky user interface or just very tedious entry fields that you have to, you know, consistently fill out, um, you will kind of see, uh, what, you know, what issues are leading to these problems. So I think when, when a physician has to enter a lot of these medications, a lot of it's duplicitive if you have to go back and do the same medication for a lot of your patients. Um, we have seen a pick list or favorites and used in that in that time. But these aren't um, I mean, these don't work for everyone, especially if you look at more general physicians, uh, you know, a family medicine and things like that, you'll be you know, prescribing all kinds of things. I've had users on our EHR system that have over 5000 favorites. So they have to save each strength and each dosage as a favorite. So if I'm doing, you know, uh, augmentin uh, 875, and I'm doing it for seven days for uh, for like a sinus infection, but I'm doing it for five days for, you know, maybe they have uh, a throat infection. So if I'm doing those two different things, I'm saving them as two different ones, and I have to find the correct one. So then you end up with way too many of these favorites. Um, but if you want to kind of edit the 875 and one time change it to 500, it clears all the fields. So there's a lot of issues like that you see in usability. Um, and one of the workarounds that I've seen is doctors actually resort to sharing their login details with nurses and other mid-level providers who can kind of take over this tedious task of order entry um, rather than bear with the clunky systems themselves. And this approach works in a way, although it's illegal, um, but it allows physicians to offload this task of order entry. Um, but accountability is, you know, um, comes up as an issue. Then what are you going to do with, with all of these uh, prescriptions that are being sent? Um, is anyone auditing them at the, at the, um, practice or the hospital? So it could lead to, um, mistakes and absence of ownership. Um, another issue is kind of the workflow. So, uh, if you actually see, there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of data entry, um, and the user interfaces are not user friendly or intuitive. If you look at Epic, um, I've implemented Epic at a hospital before. Um, we did a switch from all scripts to Epic, and it took weeks of training. Like each department had specific training that they had to go through and learn. And a lot of the younger physicians, I think, have been on Epic maybe during residency, so they had some familiarity, but overall it was it was pretty difficult to um, learn how to use epic it's not like a lot of apps today when when they're made so intuitive with a lot of thought put into it of what the user experience is like when i go to a page the first time i'm not overwhelmed with you know a bunch of different modules and screens and things to click um, if you google you know epic um, 
UI or things like that, Epic UI, EMR, you'll see what it looks like. And it looks like a 30 year old, maybe 25 year old app um, because it is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite, um, quite difficult to learn the workflows and everyone has a different workflow, right? Like if you're looking at outpatient surgery, if you're looking at anesthesiology, if you're looking at, um, you know, cardiology, if you're doing a lot of notes, you might have to learn how to use dragon, um, and other kind of dictation software. So, um, you know, when you are looking at the EMR as a whole, there's a lot of issues, but for e-prescribing in, uh, in particular, um, you also have to think about these. So I, I have actually done one thing on that kind of workaround is that, um, we once created a proxy delegation for prescribing. So this is essentially a sanctioned version of the share your password. Um, because really, um, if you look at the NCPDP script that you have to, um, put your, your e-prescribing into, it's like a format that's set by the, by the ONC in here in America. And you have to, you know, put, you know, prescriber name, this, that, that as an object and you send it, um, and you get back, uh, a response and all those things. So, uh, one of the things that you can put in is a prescriber agent field, which only requires a first name. So if you do have a mid-level or like a nurse or an MA or a PA or someone filling out your prescriptions for you, you can set up a system with a proxy, which whenever they send a prescription, it will have all of your information or all of the physician's information, but it'll have a tag that says this was sent by, uh, you know, uh, this person, right? If it's, if it's my, uh, my nurse, um, Cy, it's like, okay, this was sent by Cy, but here's all of Monis's details. Here's the, you know, NPI, here's the DEA number, all those things will show up. So, um, it kind of fixes the accountability issue because you know who's sending it on behalf of uh, the physician and things like that. Um, integration of e-prescribing systems uh, with existing health information systems is another challenge. Um, you've probably heard about interoperability ad nauseum for the last decade or so. Um, and interoperability is crucial for sharing and accessing data across different platforms. But um, if you look at the large players in this system, none of them really want to do this. Um, the data is like gold and they're, you know, hoarding it like dragons from other people accessing it. Um, so everyone kind of does the bare minimum of what's required. They did try to make some requirements. And I think there was a couple states, um, that passed things pre pandemic, but a lot of these got pushed for years and, um, have really yet to be forced upon people in order to, uh, expose their data via API or allow people to, uh, extract their data in a usable format. One thing when I say usable format, it's because oops, it's because when they have a requirement to share your data, if you're leaving that system or if you're doing something, um, in order to not, um, you know, really help competitors and things like that, they will give the data in a in an unusable format. Like here's here's like you know, a thousand pages of PDF of all your medical records. Good luck. Um, Who's going to look at that? How are you going to put it into a new system? So that's why there's, you know, interoperability standards like HL7 FHIR and things like that. Uh, FHIR is FHIR, of course. So, um, you know, all of these standards, all these interoperability things are being pushed and hopefully we see more adoption. Um, it may have to come in a more grassroots way from the smaller players up to the bigger. Um, but I do see that we have a little bit more um, kind of uh, penetration of that market these days when you see interoperability. Uh, data security, again, um, there are a lot of robust security measures in place, um, but you know, I think a lot of people just quote HIPAA all the time, um, which is a regulation, but there's a lot more around it. Um, and just kind of the data security issues that other, other systems will have, um, we will also have in e-prescribing. So this, this whole slide, the future and opportunities is maybe my favorite slide. Um, and I wish I could have just called it AI, but I'll save that for the last thing. Um, so I think one big thing is to just improve the UI and the user experience. Um, you know, this could really just involve simplifying the process, um, making it faster or more intuitive for providers. Um, and really kind of, if you have a, a design practice, um, 
maybe I could plug Ionix, you know, our, our design lead Chippy is really great at this, but it's basically, you can do a, what's called a heuristic evaluation. Um, and of course you're going to come up with tons of issues. Every, every e-prescribing system has it, but you know, how can you make it faster? How can you make it simpler? And how can you keep all of the safety and requirements that you have for the current system? So this is kind of a big, a big deal there. Um, and, and so the second point here we have is advancements in data analytics. Um, so this is also kind of, you could look at um, enhancing e-prescribing by insights into prescribing patterns. So it's again, kind of like a ML uh, machine learning type thing. Um, I don't, I won't go as far to call it AI, but to kind of look at what, what patterns a physician has. So when I start putting in Augmentin, uh, like my previous example, it'll be like, okay, this guy probably wants to do a seven day or five day course. Okay. Like these are his, uh, his options, right? So if it could kind of lead you down that path and kind of know where you're going, um, without, without, um, suggesting it itself to say like, oh yeah, like, you know, based on this, um, ICD code, like you are going to do this. I think that might be going too far. Um, and when we implemented a, um, a clinical decision support, uh, tool at Cedar sinai gosh, over 10 years ago, um, all the doctors hated it. Um, even though it came with a percentage and things like that, like nobody wanted to be told what to, what to prescribe or what to do in certain situations. So, um, there are APIs you can get even from drug databases like FDB, um, first data bank. So they're like the leader in America. Um, and really, if you look at their database, you can get all kinds of information from their APIs. So like, even when I type in, augment in uh, 875 and I click it, you can have something called the common SIG pop up if you hit that endpoint. And you could see what are the most common instructions that doctors are giving. And it'll even say, okay, you know, for this, it's, you know, 101 X7D for, you know, 67% of physicians are, are prescribing it this way. And if I want, it's, it's kind of like, you can implement it as autocomplete, right? So if I just hit tab or whatever, it'll fill that out. It's just plain text. And then I could go and, you know, delete that part of the SIG or change, you know, something if it's a unstructured SIG, of course. Um, there's also an option for structured SIGs as well, which it will kind of autofill again. And then you would go and modify it um, rather than starting from scratch. So that really does improve it quite a bit. Um, E-prescribing and telemedicine, um, I think... Telehealth services have kind of expanded and become ubiquitous now. Um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was running to get, you know, a telemedicine into their practice. Um, a lot of it of, was making platforms that aren't being used today. Um, you know, uh, for example, if you're having surgery at USC, there is a link to a, an internal video platform, but it's very difficult to log in. It's not as good as Zoom. So a lot of times doctors right before the call will have their assistant or someone send a Zoom link instead and say, hey, just join this. It's a lot easier, works for multiple devices. I don't need to be logged into my desktop at the hospital, things like that. You know, a lot of these systems, a lot of thought wasn't put in. It was just like, we got to get telemedicine going. Um, and a lot of scenarios weren't understood, like, for example, surgery versus, uh, you know, someone who's sitting in their clinic all day. Um, and yeah, the last thing or, or the second to last thing, I guess, is the competition for a monopoly. So I don't know how many people work on the back end of e-prescribing. Um, maybe that's uh, a good question to ask. But um, for those who have seen kind of the the guts behind it, you have probably heard of the name SureScripts. Um, they were created kind of by the government um, in order to adopt e-prescribing. They're a private company, though, and they had an antitrust suit against them, I don't know, a year or two years ago. Um, and they run over 98% of e-prescribing in the US. So that is quite a monopoly or quite, uh, you know, something that looks like uh, they don't really have much competition. Uh, but the company I mentioned earlier, uh, FDB, which is the leader in the kind of the drug data. So uh, they have the biggest drug database, MedKnowledge. And if you're, if you're using FDB, which the majority of people, majority of health systems in the US are using FDB. You're basically pulling that drug information from them. And then you're you're formatting it yourself into the proper uh, NCPDP format, whatever you're using now, um, you know, they switched from 10.6 to script 2017 a few years ago. 
So if you're using the latest script 2017071, you would have to format it in that format and then send it through sure scripts and sure scripts would then route it to the correct pharmacy um, and the pharmacy would receive that information. So FDB is kind of tried to cut out the middleman with their new software called Vela or Vela, V-E-L-A. So they're kind of like, we already supply all the drug information. Why don't we do the routing as well? Um, and the Vela platform is actually pretty cool because you don't have to do as much of that um, formatting manually that you have to do with SureScripts because SureScripts is like, give us the, give us the, the, electronic message in the perfect format and we'll make sure it gets to its destination whereas fdb is trying to become kind of the the single source to say okay we'll give, not only give you the drug information but we'll also package it for you and send it um along our our network um which probably cost them you know i mean definitely cost them millions and millions of dollars to create this network so um, i'd say that they're pretty heavily invested and I think the near term future will, will be interesting to see how that how that plays out um, with the actual competition for sure scripts. And for AI now, which is all the craze, everyone's talking about AI and everything. Um, some people just spam about regulation. Other people are excited. Other people are, you know, skeptical. So, you know, just to kind of think about uh, things like GPT and NLP, um, in in e-prescribing to see like so you know how can we how can we use th this software you know this new emerging tech to improve the future of e-prescribing so really i think that you know gpt is being a language model that's trained on a diverse range of internet text um but you can train your own gpt model um which isn't that difficult because OpenAI has tools for developers in order to do this and have kind of a more narrow version of chat GPT, um, which won't be in a chat form, right? You know, GPT-4 is, is, you know, API based, you can really do a lot with it. So rather than the chat GPT version, which has a broad understanding of human language, and can create, you know, coherent text, uh, contextually relevant sentences, and, you know, um, all these things that they've shown in medicine as well for being able to pass the USMLE. Um, these things are somewhat impressive, but how can they really help the real world? So I think um, if you kind of couple these, uh, you know, GPT and NLP's ability to understand, interpret, and generate human knowledge, you can really uh, train these tools to automate the process of filling out prescription forms based on a physician's uh, written notes or even spoken. Uh, you know, word. So this can really significantly reduce the time to fill each prescription. Um, it can even, you know, maybe replace that kind of proxy um, and just kind of make it a really quick streamlined process. You don't have to do things. You just say, okay, do this. And um, I'm not sure how we'll say who's filling it out because still the physician is in the end. Um, there is a requirement after you click send on the e-prescription that there's a that there is a review so you must review each prescription so even if ai fills it out for you the ultimate click of yes this is correct has to be done by the physician um and you know i think that would be really helpful and another thing would be if we can kind of have more smart suggestions so kind of like i said how fdb has that common sig where you can say hey 67 percent of the time they're doing it for seven days with this type of thing you know one in the morning one at night however they want to say it um so rather than that, it's kind of a recommendation system where you don't, again, you don't tell the physician what to do because we've we've gone down that road um, a long time ago and it did not work. But, you know, um, um, for example, you could, when you're typing in a diagnosis or if you have kind of a differential, the system could could already start thinking of relevant medications commonly associated with that condition. Um, it doesn't have to suggest, uh, you know, Hey, do you want to do doxycycline based on this thing? You know, like it doesn't have to say, you know, suggest the final thing, but um, it could help in this part kind of to reduce cognitive load and to, just to like speed up the prescription process. Cause like I said, it takes a long time um, um, in order to do this. And the other thing I was going to say is you can also train these models for error detection. So rather than for filling or in addition to filling, you can also say, program it to identify potential prescription errors. 
such as an incorrect dosage or a truly harmful drug interaction. So right now, um, e-prescribing systems, all of them have drug-drug interactions. Um, you know, some will have things like drug-food interactions. There's even an API from FDB that'll check this for you, but you have to obviously send um, the medication list in addition to the new medication that you're sending, and it'll cross-reference all of them with each other. Um, the big problem with this in reality is that um, it's it's often difficult to filter out what the real real interactions are versus what's a very you know uh, unconcerning interaction. Um, I think a really a really funny one is like Vaseline conflicts with Doxy, so you get like a pop up that's like, hey, like you know here is a here is a drug drug interaction. You're like, okay, this isn't you know a big concern, and um, I'd say the reason why drug drug interactions pop up or jump up is to prevent harm, but it's nearly 90% of them are overwritten. Like, like, like the doctor will just override them and prescribe anyways. So it's a lot of clicking and it really contributes to alert fatigue. So if you're able to kind of tweak that or allow the physician to um, understand what's going to be an important drug, drug interaction or drug food interaction, or, you know, um, any other interactions like that, that are able to come up, um, only showing the relevant ones. Um, and again, you don't want to say hide forever or like, or, or like, don't show me this interaction again, because, um, in a different context, you may be more concerned. Maybe it's like a young patient versus a very elderly patient. And you're like, ah, this young guy, I don't need to worry about his rash. But in an elderly patient, if you're like, oh, okay, these two may create a rash and she already has this issue. So I should totally, uh, maybe look at a different drug or something like that. Um, so it is a lot of um, things that you need to kind of um, think about in context. So while GPT is great at understanding context for conversation in medication, it may be a little more difficult. Um, and the last thing for AI, I think um, for EPCS as well, for, for controlled substances, um, I think we need to update the kind of two-factor authentication we do today. So right now when you're doing um, the electronic uh, prescribing of controlled substances, which is like, you know, uh, opioids and things like that, as well as, um, you know, even Ambien and things like that are, are technically in that, in that space. So, um, we, when we're looking at these, these security measures, they are more sensitive and you need to do, you need to take even more time. So right now you, you have a two factor authentication that you need to do on a separate device. So if I'm e-prescribing on my phone, I can't use my phone as the authenticator. Um, you either need a, a different hardware device or I need to e-prescribe on my computer and keep my phone there because uh, it'll give you a 30 second window to input a code, um, which is one major way that you do EPCS. So you're able to quickly type in that. Um, generally, I think it's a five digit code, five or six digit code, and then you can, you can um, continue on with prescribing your medication. Uh, so I think, if we can keep that security, by, but but still making it easier, um, you know, AI can really detect who who is who is the user um, just based on usage patterns. Um, you don't need to say like, okay, like this is you know someone logged in as Monus and prescribing under his name. Um, even if you have proxy, even if you're using AI here, you know, you could have a bit more on fraud detection, um, and you know, it could flag unusually high volumes of controlled substances that are being prescribed by a specific provider, or it could flag an unusual combination of drugs. So I've, I've caught multiple um, pill mills and things like that in my career. Um, and I think it's, it's not that easy for, for, I guess, a regular product manager to, to look or a regular engineer, um, because the safeguards that are built, for example, might be like um, 120 Vicodin or um, 120 Norco. And then you'll see people start prescribing 119, 117, 116 um, in order to avoid flagging. And then they'll also start adding in, you know, two random drugs around it to make it seem like, you know, this is some combination that like, oh, like, yeah, I'm giving Norco, but I'm also giving azithromycin and Tylenol or something, right? So it's like, oh, like, wait, like, this is a lot of Tylenol. What is, what are, like, what is this combination and things like that? And if you see, because I found practices that were doing it, you know, you know, thousands per day opioids for weeks. And um, you, you have to kind of question like, okay, like, does this make any sense? They're doing it every 15 minutes, it looks automated. Um, are they just kind of trying to hide this? And you know, even if you shut them down, they'll just open up in a, in a new software and do the same thing. 
Um, so, th so that kind of fraudulent thing, if we can detect it rather than wait and like manually look for like, oh, like, you know, six weeks of crazy prescribing from this practice until the pharmacy raises a red flag and it comes to us, and then we have to look into it. Rather than that, if that red flag can be raised internally by using AI would be great. Um, the last thing is really regulatory compliance. Um, so I think understanding regulatory text and flagging non-compliant practices could be great. Um, I think, you know, maintaining adherence to these complex regulations uh, is almost like a full-time job. Um, as things keep changing, you need someone who's going to constantly be on top of what's happening and exactly what you need to do. So um, I think this is another one of the last things that I'll say here, but um, I think the future of e-prescribing, um, you know, kind of using these, these temporary solutions like tolerating inefficiencies or delegating responsibilities are only kind of scratching the surface of the problem. Um, I think today we need to streamline workflows, enhance user experience, uh, and make a lot of design improvements. Um, but ultimately, I think the potential for, revol for revolutionizing, excuse me, e-prescribing lies closer to the AI technologies and GPT and NLP. So, you know, despite the challenges that we have today with AI integration, these technologies uh, do look towards a future of e-prescribing where it's much more seamless integrated uh, part of the healthcare journey rather than what it is today, which is kind of a tedious chore. Um, I don't know if we could ask, ask any physicians, but I, it is a pretty tedious chore today in, in order to e-prescribe. Yes, um, I, I think the more specialized folks will disagree, say, oh yeah, no, it's great. Like I, I prescribe these 10 meds, I just click which one I want and it goes quick. But um, yeah, speaking to you know my friends from med school and others, it is kind of a tedious task as well that they feel. Um, so I think integrating AI as soon as possible will give a lot of interesting um, data. And you know, in the future, when we do have it kind of seen, um, we will have to see what kind of collaborative effort comes between healthcare providers, system designers, and of course, regulatory bodies um, and patients. So hopefully we'll see what happens with uh, the path as we go on. I think there's a lot of innovation, creativity, and collaboration that needs to be done. And uh, yeah, I think we'll not only navigate the complex patient journey, but we'll also have a more efficient, user-friendly, and robust e-prescribing uh, kind of ecosystem. So uh, I think with that, talk a little bit about how we can help. I think it might be cut off on the bottom, but, you know, um, I, I have... I of course um, consult quite a bit, um, both with customers and individually. Um, we do a lot of kind of um, tailored solutions as well. Um, I work closely with organizations to understand kind of the needs and requirements, uh, you know, help to identify and implement the most suitable uh, solutions, whether it's using AI or not uh, for improving patient care. Uh, we do a lot of integration. So like um, I'm both a physician and clinical product manager, um, which was on the second slide. I don't know if I mentioned, but, you know, um, I think when we're doing these kind of integrations, um, whether it's uh, you're, uh, whether you're looking at doing more of like interoperability or just adding, adding some features or just improving design, um, you know, we have all of that in, in addition to support and maintenance. Um, and I think the last thing of AI solutions, again, like, we don't create the AI ourselves, but if you need AI, um, kind of an AI solution implemented, um, whether it's training your model or if it's, um, you know, just making sure the correct data is going in and flowing out and how it needs to work and just more of like, you know, what, what the AI solution needs to look like. So I have my little caveat that I added, which is, um, is implementing AI solutions using APIs and other tools rather than creating the AI ourselves. So. Um, yeah, our focus is helping healthcare organizations adopt AI technologies in a responsible and effective manner, um, providing seamless integration, tailored uh, solutions, data security, and additional support and training. Um, we'll uh, almost wrap it up here with the get in touch. Uh, we'd, we'd be happy to hear from uh, anyone in today's uh, webinar. And uh, if we have uh, any questions, I will. I know that there's at least a 10 second lag between real time, so I'll wait this time instead of assuming there's no question and stopping recording. Um, all right.
Uh, we have a question about e-prescriptions uh, in the pet space. So um, yeah, this is one thing that I that I um, have been looking into recently as well. I did mention pet medicine, um, that they do a lot more in veterinary medicine with paper and faxing still. Um, so when you look at the, at the, um, excuse me, um, when you look at the kind of um, e-prescription space for humans um, in pets right now, um, if you look at the largest kind of providers, you see, um, uh, Chewy is actually at the top, which is also like a prescription, sorry, a subscription for, for pet food. And um, it's basically, um, you can go online, you can select what food and things you want. And if you need medications, they also have that as like, it looks almost like an Amazon shop. But when you select a medication, it'll say, it'll say like, you need a prescription for this. And what you need to do then is it, it takes you to a form where you need to fill out your, your doctor's name and practice and address and phone number and fax number and all those things um, that you'll find online if you Google your, your, your veterinarian. And then it's, it's, it's like a Wizard of Oz process where they will manually go and fax the doctor the e prescription sorry, the, the prescription request, and then the doctor will approve or um, call or whatever. And sometimes they'll also call, but uh, generally they'll fax. And it happens through fax, which used to be the same for, for human medicine as well, paper prescriptions. Uh, you'd see a lot of faxing in, uh, in the older days. But uh, yeah, so right now that's how it, it works. Um, I mentioned FDB's uh, Fila platform, which they're trying to launch for um, competing with SureScripts and their prescription routing. Um, their Vila platform looks like it's focusing on pet meds first in order to kind of just get into the space uh, and then kind of work up to human meds since um, I think the cost of acquisition or to get people to switch off of SureScripts is pretty high, um, pretty difficult um, because SureScripts is so entrenched for two decades. So, so they're kind of entering in pet med space, it looks like, um, based on their website and, um, and then trying to expand after that, I'd assume. So, uh, yeah, I think it is, it is going on from, from like, kind of like the pet space. Um, we may see legislation coming for pet medicine, uh, for pet prescriptions as well. Um, especially when you have two big players, um, you know, uh, right now, sure scripts is, is, is just in human meds, but, but they are kind of, um, like, it doesn't matter who the medications for they're doing the routing for any kind of e-prescription. So if you are sending a standard message in the ncpdp script language then you will then you can use sure scripts so um sure scripts uh will also be competing with fdb in the space in order to kind of deny their entry so it's so it is interesting the the kind of e-prescribing uh space for pets right now but um we'll see how it shakes out uh in the future because i think it could go a lot of ways right now um and i'm a little more focused on human med but um, yeah, as far as what I know from, from veterinary medicine right now, it's all paper facts and, uh, yeah, there's a couple of players getting in for e-prescription. So might be, might be something to keep an eye on in the, in the very near future. All right, I'll give another couple seconds. If anyone has any other questions, uh, happy to answer. Um, or if anyone wants to reach out and ask me uh, personally, feel free to do that as well. I think my contact info is still on the screen. Uh, all right. Have you encountered any specific regulatory or policy related challenges that hindered the successful implementation of e-prescribing? Um, I don't think I've 
encountered any specific policy related uh, challenges that hindered implementation, um, I would say that policy related changes generally um, impact what's already been implemented. Um, like if you have a system and all of a sudden now you need to, um, like there was a one state that had an exchange, gosh, I can't remember the state, uh, I think it was like North Carolina or something, but it was like one state that was requiring you to use um, like some additional info. And then it was like, okay, it's going to cost us a lot to implement this thing. How are we going to comply with this state versus like the other 49 states, which, which don't require this at all. Um, so it is a bit, it is a bit um, like, yeah, I would say it's less of implementing and more of just kind of like accommodating the change, right? Like, um, and generally, you'll see organizations, especially kind of EHR organizations, which is where the majority of e-prescribing takes place. Um, we used to call it CPOE, computerized physician order entry, but I don't think anyone uses that term anymore. Um, but yeah, basically, when you're already doing CPOE or you know e-prescribing, um, it's it's not like you have to like very few people are starting from scratch. Is kind of what I'm trying to say um, when you're talking about implementation due to uh, regulatory issues. It's that you need to modify your existing implementation in order to um, abide by the new rules. So if the new rule states that you now need to do some additional or share some additional info, um, it becomes quite difficult in order to kind of fit that into your, your product roadmap or whatever you're doing for your organization. So generally what I've seen is that you kind of want to do the minimum amount of work to um, satisfy the minimum requirements. You don't go above and beyond and be like, okay, like how can I implement this in a seamless manner for everyone? You're just like, okay, how can I quickly adhere to this new uh, thing that's going to take place at the end of the year uh, while still doing all the other uh, you know, feature work that I want to do? So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So I, Give another few seconds if anyone else has any questions. Otherwise, we can wrap it up and uh, hope to chat with some of you privately afterwards uh, since I have my info here. So anything comes up, feel free to reach out. Um, cool. All right. Oh, yes, there we go. Thank you. <laughs>